Amen. Amen. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. I'm so glad for all the work you do at Young Life. Actually, when I was sitting there, uh, I was like, oh man, this is in some ways the perfect transition for our sermon today. Because, uh, I mean, I know that's how we planned it, but we didn't plan it this way also. <laughs> uh, uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Pastor Jerry and Wilson. Everybody calls me J. Will. I get the privilege of being the planting pastor of this young church. Uh, City of Refuge, where Simple Church is seeking to call all to Jesus to connect to his great family and live commissioned as kingdom citizens. Um, today we will be finishing up our sermon series. We're doing our, a, a spiritual discipline sermon series on evangelism called Commission for Glory. And our sermon for today is called Burden for Glory. Every Sunday, if you've been here more than once, you've probably heard us say, call, connect, commission. This is kind of the mantra of our church. We are a called people. We are a connected people. We are a commissioned people. But have you ever wondered what it meant and why we say this every Sunday? Well, one of the ways you can find out beyond this sermon is we have a Seek and Refuge lunch right after service. So if you want to get plugged into the church, see Justin about the Seek and Refuge lunch. But the other thing I want to let you know is the reason we say this often is because we truly do want to see all call to Jesus. We, we want to see all come to know Jesus, and we want to connect him to his greater family, and we want to live commissioned as his kingdom citizens because we have this burden. This burden of seeing God's glory go everywhere in this dark world. As Courtney was up here uh, speaking about Young Life Ministry, I was reminded, actually, one of the reasons we have this burden is because people in our neighborhood is dying, and they are going to hell, and we want to see them in glory. Sadly, this year, in Young Life itself, two of the students that were killed in our neighborhood was being reached by them. They, they were sharing the gospel on a regular basis by them. They felt this burden to say, come and know Jesus' family. This is why we say call, connect, commission every Sunday. This is our, our burden, and I ask you why you're here. Is this also your burden? Do you come because you want just an encouraging word, or you want to feel like you're checking a box, or are you burdened because you want more of God's glory and you want to experience it more? Do you long to see the lost found? John Piper actually writes about this loss being found. He says, have you ever wondered what it feels like to have a love for the loss? This is a term we use as part of our Christian jargon. Many believers search their hearts in condemnation, looking for the arrival of some feeling of benevolence that will propel them into bold evangelism. It would never happen. It is impossible to love the loss. You can't deeply, you can't feel deeply for an abstraction or a concept. You will find it impossible to love deeply an unfamiliar individual portrayed in a photograph, let alone a nation or a race or a people or something as vague as all lost people. What John is saying it is, it is impossible to have this burden without having some form of a relationship. We can say we want to see all people lost, but if we refuse to have relationships with more people than our immediate sphere, we truly can't have this burden. Are you burdened? Do you care about God's glory spreading? Today in our text, we're actually going to see Paul himself was a man who was burdened for the faith of his fellow Israelites to come. And know Jesus. Matter of fact, this is how deep Paul's burden was. If you go back one chapter to chapter 9, verse 1 through 3, he says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I, can, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. This was a man who was burdened. He wanted to see the Israelites know Christ. Not just the Israelites, but he 
absolutely wanted those who know better to know Christ. In our context, this looks like we live in, we, we always talk about the nun or those who've never heard, but we're in America, we're in Eau Claire, more than likely people have heard about God. They know church. They've been experienced to church and ease. But they don't know Christ. And as God's people, we want them to be a part, connected to the church, but connection to the church first comes from this calling them to understand who Jesus is. That was Paul's burden. He said the Israelites, they know the customs, they know the Torah, they know the law, they know all these things that point somewhere, but they don't know who it points to. And as we go through this text today as a people, I long to be burdened for God's glory to advance. I want you to know that if you are burdened, you have beautiful feet. You you have beautiful feet. And if you are burdened, you experience glory for glory. And lastly, if you are burdened, if you are burdened, you are also one of those who were once disobedient. So we should be more understanding. Look at that verses 14 through 14 through 15 when he talks about how can they call on him? How then can they call on him they have not believed in? How can they believe without hearing about him? How can they hear without a preacher? Paul is asking this rhetorical question. Hey, we want all to believe, but how can they? Who's going to tell them? Uh, how, how are they going to believe without knowing about the name or knowing his truths or seeing his ways? How can they believe? How can they know? How can they hear if nobody's going to declare the word? Thank you, Nadine. That's a good amen right there. <laughs> How can they hear if no one preaches? And when we see this word preacher, we probably think, well, that's what you're doing, right? You're in the pulpit. But see, this is a different kind of preaching. This isn't just a heralding from across the pulpit, but this is a heralding that goes on every single day of a believer's life. It's a continuous going and showing and being, and they are a people who know for themselves the good news. How can they hear without a preacher? And then he asks this very pointed question, how can they preach unless they are sent? What does it mean to be sent? You might think it's a commissioning service or you're part of a a missionary agency or you've been elevated as we did with Justin last week to elevate him into the role of pastoring. No, no, to be sent are those who've been called. To be a disciple that goes forth and make disciples are just the call of those who now say they are disciples. Meaning if you have responded, you have been sent. If you have put your faith in, you have put up to go, you are now the sent ones. Maybe a better picture is You've been brought out of a dark room, given a flashlight, and now being put back into the dark room to say, now shine the light around. This little light of mine, let it shine. You have been sitting now back into the darkness. And then there's this encouragement. It says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This verse right here introduces us. It's a quote back to Isaiah, pointing us back to a song called the Servant Song. This was the songs that were going to declare of who Jesus is and what Jesus has come to do. But now we are a part of the servant song. We have been, now the singing that goes forth to Jesus is also for those who have received glory. If you've not remembered the past few weeks, I told you in the beginning, Jesus brought glory to us so that we could come into glory. And we have received glory, as Justin pointed, that now his name is written on us and we are his. And then last week, I said, we share in this glory. Or, 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 or we go from being groaners to reconcile to glory to bring other groaners to glory. So what does he mean by the beautiful feet, this servant song? When Isaiah... Chapter 52, verse 7 through 8. 
This is where he's getting this. He says, how beautiful in the mountains are the feet of the herald who proclaim peace, who brings news of good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns the voices of your watchmen. They lift up their voices shouting for joy together. For every eye will see when the Lord returns to Zion, when he is saying the burden have beautiful feet. This is a euphemism as you are a person who has received joy to tell others to enjoy. How often do you consider you are a part of bringing joy into the world? Like, like, I know that's something I wrestle with because I feel I don't bring joy to people. I bring burdens on people. But God said, no, no, if you're mine, you're now a joy bringer. <laughs> you, you now, everywhere you go, should exude this joy for all to see. This is the beautiful feet we now have. You and I, we are those who have beautiful feet. But have you experienced this joy firsthand? Do you know this joy for yourself? Do you believe you're enjoyable? Something you must wrestle with. Family, I want to let you know, if you are in Christ, you are enjoyable. There is never a time when the body should not want you around, even if there is problems. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation again last week, meaning we come to each other, resolve problems so we can experience joy together. You're enjoyable. So when we do discipleship and we do our one-on-ones reading the Bible together, it's because we enjoy God's Word and we enjoy each other. As we practice presence with one another, we do this so that joy can be experienced first and foremost. Now, you're hearing this, but you probably got this already in the back of your mind. Okay, but wait, what if they don't receive me? The famous but, what about what do you do if someone tells you that the gospel, someone who tells you they don't believe the gospel, and after you tell them about Jesus, they continue not to believe? Well, 16 through 19 says, the burden bearer experiences glory for glory. Look at verses 16 through 19 for me. It says, for not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. But I ask you, did they not hear? Yes, they did. Their voices is going out to the whole earth and the words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses said, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation, and I will make you angry by a nation and that lacks understanding. We're going to walk through this and break it down piece by piece. He says, not all have obeyed, meaning every time you declare the gospel and you tell people the truth, that does not mean they're going to say, oh, that's right, I believe. Not all will believe. And we'll see in a few minutes, why not? He says, Lord, who has believed our message? But he says, but that's not for you to worry about if they believe. You should worry about if they experience what you believe through you. It says, so faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. What is heard is you explaining the truth, but that second heard is actually an interesting word. It's not the act of listening, but it's the act of seeing. It's, it's the act of you, you, you practice what you preach. You walk that walk. You talk that talk. I see everything you're saying. What is heard comes through the message about Christ. Family, when people look at your life, everything you say about Jesus isn't reflected in how you live. This is something we should always wrestle with. It's something I wrestle with. Every time I'm like, Lord, I just pray they see Jesus a little more. I know I messed up a couple times yesterday. I might have said some things I shouldn't. I probably cussed. But I want them to see the Lord a little more and more. Help me. Sanctify me. I want to be a good example of talking that talk, walking that walk, so that everything they hear lines up about the truth of who I say he is. So it's the act of experiencing through us what they see in us. 
But he says, I want you to realize they're not saved because they're going to experience your faith. I, actually, the message of God has been testified since the beginning. That the voices have, at verse 6 to 18, when it says, the voices have gone to the whole earth and the words to the ends of the world, this is actually mentioning back to the psalm we read at the beginning of our service. That's Psalm 19. He says, all of creation declares God is here. God is showing off his majesty. So obviously, it's not because we got the most convincing words or we live the best life that people will be saved, but... It's because God is faithful to call all to himself. Now, how will he call them to himself? Verse 19. But I asked, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that lacks understanding. This is quoting back to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I won't make you turn there, but to give you an overview, this is where he's laying out his blessings and cursings before God's people. He says, I will bless you because you're my people. But let me tell you, as my people, you must stay my people, but some of you will turn away. He's like, I you would turn away and run after the idols of this world. You could look it up later. Isaiah, I mean, uh, Deuteronomy 32, he said, you would look after the idols of this world. You will make me jealous, and because you make me jealous, I must make you jealous. And how will he make you jealous? How will he make those around you jealous? He will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation, their lack of understanding. It, this is this picture of because you didn't want to play with the ball, I gave the ball to someone else to play with, and now you're jealous because you're looking at them and saying, it looks like they're having a good time. And he's like, you could too. You could too. This is this, you, they experience glory from your life for glory. So as God is glorifying you and making and elevating you and showing himself off in you, they should look at it and actually have some jealousy. They should see something different. And when I say that, I don't mean that everything's going to be good in your life and prosperity is going to happen. But that means when life hits you and you turn to God and they see how God carries you through, it should make them long. Hold on, what's different about them? How are they experiencing all of this yet seem to have this joy? What is that? This is this jealousy the world sees. This is how the world should see the church. The world should look at the church and always be like, man, we got all this. We got the fame. We got the wealth. We got all these things. But these are people who got a joy I don't have. And why can't I have that? That's how we are supposed to live. We are supposed to magnify this great, glorious joy. And even in those seasons when times are hard, he promises he will give us joy. This is what it looks like for that joy to advance across the world through you and through your life. And this is what it looks like to make the world jealous because your God is good and the gods of this world ain't. The God of fame is not a good God. It continues to take. The God of money is not a good God. It continues to take. The God of sex and addiction is not a good God because it continues to take. It tells you you're never desired. You're never satisfied. But the God of our kingdom, says, in me, you have full satisfaction. You can rest. Oh, family, what if we realized what it meant to be a restful people? What if in the midst of the burdens of seeing the brokenness of our world, we realized what it meant to rest in Christ? To take on and embody the joy that he continues to pour out on us. Are you here today and you feel the burden, but you don't feel that rest? God, I want to let you know, if you are here, we would love to pray for you so you can feel his rest today. We would love to come alongside you, walk with you, show you about a God that is better than this world. We would, help, we would love to help you lift up your eyes and see his kingdom. Hmm. This is why we come together, so we can shoulder each other's. Burdens. We can shoulder the griefs of this world and we can point each other, look at him, look ahead. 
you know, what's sad about the church often is we are so unrelatable because often we feel we have to have it all together. But the truth is we have a Savior who saves us because we don't have it all together. And once we realize we have a Savior who saves us because we don't have it all together, our burdens, all, all, all burdens make sense. And we are able to understand the world that is burdened by their sins, who is being crushed under the weight of this world. This is landing the plane, what he says in verses 20 and 21. Isaiah says boldly, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I revealed myself to those who were not asking for me. And to Israel, he says, all day long I held out my hands to a disobedient and defiant people. Family, if you are burdened to see God's glory, we are burdened for those who are disobedient. Because we understand what it means Meant, meant and means to be those who were once disobedient. Do you understand you were disobedient? Do you understand you still wrestle with your obedience in Christ now? If you understand your wrestlings right now, it should actually give you the freedom to tell people, my Savior still calls me. My Savior still loves me. Matter of fact, <clears throat> Titus Paul wrote to his young protege in Titus chapter 3, verse 3 through 7. He says, For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by faith, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. Where does it say that that happened after we ended our disobedience. Where did it say that happened after our foolishness? Now, don't get me wrong. That don't mean I, li I leave this place that I'm going to live however I want to live. Now, No, that means when you repent, you repent and turn to the one who wasn't disobedient, who wasn't foolish. He has all wisdom, and he continues to call you to himself to learn more and washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This is a one-time occurrence. This is a continued occurrence. We are the burdened ones who know who to turn to. So we know what it means to have once been disobedient, and we know what it means to still wrestle through some disobedience now, but we also know what it means to be able to turn and have one who will bring us in. You see, the one who will bring us in is the one who came from glory himself. The one who will bring us close is the one who lived perfectly unlike us. The one who will bring us in is the one who died and took all of your sins on himself. And now in him, you are the righteousness of Christ in God. In him. <laughs> Family, are you are burdened by your own sins today, I want to let you know today is the day you have a place to turn, someone you can turn to who will take your sins on himself and wash you and make you righteous, and he will say, follow me, and as you follow me faithfully, I will continue to clean you up until that day when you will stand in the midst of glory. And this is for, say, this is for sinner and saint. Don't, don't ever think, saints, that you are too far, like, well, that ain't for me, I'm good. No, 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 you should still feel the weight of your sin sometimes. The closer you get to the Lord, it's almost like he reveals more and more of sin so that we'll know more and more how to repent and believe, to trust in him. But because we know more and more how to believe and trust in him, we should be able to see those who are wrestling with sin and don't know where to turn. 
How does that practically look in our context, in our church? That means when we pray for our neighborhood, it's not just words we say, but we actually want to be people in our neighborhood. We want to be present in our neighborhood. We want to understand the struggles of our neighborhood. When we see addiction at the Obama store, we want to be able to say, man, I know I was addicted to my sin too. Let me help you. Let me walk with you. And yes, I know it ain't going to be uh, overnight. They're going to get it all together, but I just want to be close to you and tell you about the one who has called the disobedient to himself. This is us coming and bearing the weight with each other so that we continue to point each other for to glory. We are burdened because we want to see each other live out the realities of this glory here and the glory that is to come. But maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't care about none of that. I'm just trying to get mine. I'm not, I don't care about if people come to Christ. I, I hope they do. That'd be nice. But it ain't for me. Hear these words from Charles Spurgeon. He says, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself. Be sure of that. See, those who have been saved are those who look around and say, man, others need what I got. Others need what I have received. They need this good news because it is truly joyful and joyous news. And we get to enjoy seeing them come to know him. As I close, church, as those praying that we are people who are burdened for this glory in our neighborhood. This is the end of that John Piper quote I started with. He says, don't wait for a feeling or love in order to share Christ with a stranger. You already love your heavenly father. And you know that this stranger is created by him, but separated from him. So take those first steps in evangelism because you love God. It is not primarily out of a compassion for humanity that we share our faith or pray for the lost. It is first and foremost because of our love for God. I ask you today, do you truly love the Lord? Do you long to see more of his glory in Eau Claire, in the surrounding areas? Do you long to see his glory spread? Or do you just, are you trying to get your little piece of this pie in the sky? The kingdom of God is not about you you do get to benefit for him. You get to be an heir. It is for you, but not about you. And because it's not about you, we get to call, live out the marching orders of the one who is bringing this kingdom on earth. Jesus said, all authority is in my hand. Go therefore, make disciples, every nation. That means all people, everyone you run by, baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that you have seen from me, received from me, know in me. But Here's the beautiful promise. He didn't say, do this in your effort. He says, do this because I'm with you. Oh, glorious people. Oh, joy, overjoy people. Oh, overwhelm people who need joy today. I want to let you know Christ is with you. And if you turn to him, he will always be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And he will continue to say, my arms are open. Come. Will you come to him? Will you turn from, to him? Will you let your burden lead you towards Glory. Or will you continue to carry this burden on your own, leading you further and further away from the one who promises all glory? Will you pray with me? Almighty God, the Redeemer and the giver of our salvation. Oh, Lord, how we long for your glory in this world. We long to be where you are with you at all times. And, Father, we know we are not perfect, but yet you continue to shine your face on us. And, Lord, I pray today as we close this series, Commission for Glory, that we truly would be a people who live out this mantra of our call, connect, and commission to follow you to live out your truth and know that you are with us. 
Lord, if there are those who are under the sound of my voice who may not know you today, Lord, I pray that you would call them to yourself, that they would repent and put their faith in you, knowing that your son died on their behalf, but also resurrected so that they can find life and life more abundantly in him. We cry out, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. For one day, our faith will be, called, will be known as sight. And we will experience nothing but your bliss and your glory. So, Father, use these words to transform our hearts. Help us to pursue you more and to know you more so that others can experience you more. We ask all these things in your matchless son Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and continue to sing with us?